Hello, everyone. Get that off of there. <laughs> All right. Say hello. Hello. You gotta talk louder. Hello. Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so we're back with another installment of Going Through Weird Tales. This is Weird Tales, Volume 1, Issue 1, Part 2. Again, from 1923 in March. Um, and I can't remember who it was, um, and I apologize for not having that information in front of me right now. But, um some lovely viewer was like yeah that cover you have sucks balls and that's not what it looked like um and this is what it looks like and then sent me a link to this image that you're seeing right now this is um more in lines of what the cover looked like originally um and as you can see um another viewer said that she's not naked those are riding pants and sure as s they are yeah and um, she has a proper colored shirt and everything on yeah and she has a belt buckle if you look and everything yeah. the main difference i think between this and the other i feel like the other they had just a couple colors they could use that's why everything was matching yeah but like the bear thing you can't even really see it I think that's the ooze. I know. I'm trying to, like, not ruin stuff. Yeah. But, you know, in the last one, how it was, like... Yeah, I know. It was, real like... Real shiny, and you could see it. Like, I could just show it to you now. So you could look at it. Um, I think. Oh, wait. I have to go like that. There it is, because it's all reds and oranges. I'll have to go over to here. And, and the ooze is all... Oh, the tentacle thing is all... Like, if you look, yeah. like, it's really, like, I could tell that they're riding pants now. Um, and the bear head is a completely different color than the tentacles. Yeah. So this is just a bad cover. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, that again, makes a lot more sense. I apologize for not having your name right here so I could just say thank you like a normal person. Oh my gosh, you get, there's so much more detail in it. Yeah, there is. Um, this guy who did this cover, um, I wanted to have a little bit more information on him. I did find some info. I think he did this cover and maybe the next cover. And I think that's all he ever did. I had the info. I was on... Um, the speculative fiction database and found his information and found his um, obituary. So, um, but again, that was like two weeks ago and now I can't remember. I came into this thinking we were just talking about the story. I know. We and then I remembered, I'm like, oh yeah, we were going to talk about the cover again. Um, so yeah. So that is that. So, um, that's a much better looking cover. So let's get into what we're talking about today. So if we go, actually have to bring this down a bit and we will go, we went through some ads, but we're going to be talking about not the 22 remarkable short stories this time. We're going to be talking about the three unusual novelettes. So we have A Dead Man's Tale by Willard E. Hawkins, and A Standing Yarn That Will Hold You Spellbound and Make You Breathe Fast with a New Mental. Hang on. Uh, sensation. I'm like, eration isn't a word. <laughs> um, Ooze by Anthony M. Rudd. I can't read that. A remarkable short novel by a master of goose flesh fiction. Mm -hmm. And then The Chain by Hamilton Craigie. Craigie 
is at his best here. Which is good. Because if he was at his middle, I would have been very upset that we were reading it. Yeah. Why would we want his middle work? Who wants a middle work? Where are you going? Oh my gosh, no, that's so, uh, Why did you <laughs> get me all excited that you well, made notes? Well, I made some, but whether I can find them or not. Okay, so first things, first things effing last here, people. We are going to go down to here. Weird Tales, the unique magazine, edited by Edwin Baird. Volume 1, number 1, 25 cents a copy, March 1923. Subscription is something a year, a little bit more in Canada. For scalp, prickling thrills, and stark terror, read The Dead Man's Tale by Willard E. Hawkins. What's going on? Where do you find stuff on here? Do you want me to find it for you? You're, you're, you're way too far. It's the first story. It's not the first story. It is the first story. Here, go like this. I don't think I've made notes on this one anyway. You didn't make notes on it. <laughs> Well, that was a waste of freaking time. So, um, Willard E. Hawkins, if I recall, um, as Willard Hawkins, he wrote some sci-fi stuff um, that we should probably go over at some point. Um, but now, let's talk about this story. Okay, so right at the beginning we get that this is a dead man's tale because of the title. And then it starts with, they called me when I walked the earth in a body of dead matter, Richard Devaney. What did you think of this? It's my favorite. Is it? Yeah. Shut the front door. I, I really like this one. Are you serious? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, my major beef with this story is it's the dead man's tale. The first line tells you he's not alive anymore. I was killed in the second battle of Marnie on July 24th, 1918. Marn. Marn. Okay, so the second sentence, he says he's dead. Now... What bothers me about this is that as we come into how he died, it is seriously like the most suspenseful, tense scene out of anything I've read in these. Yeah, but it was really good. the suspense isn't there because we already know he dies. I know. So, like, it just mm. lost like a huge... Like, that would have been, like, the most... Like, if they hadn't done the in introductory paragraph. And, and the they title. Just went, yeah, and they just went straight into it. Oh, yeah. That would have been, like... Yeah. Like, when... But I think that's the thing of the time, isn't it? It was, like, the, the way they set things up. And I the, guess. I mean, I it, it seems very gothic-y. Like, very Poe, very... Yeah. Um, but, like... When he's like lifting his rifle up to shoot the dude. Yeah. And he's like, and I could see the guy pulling the trigger or whatever. And I was just a second too late on my trigger. I was like, like the whole time you're like, oh, 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 oh. like, is he going to get his gun up in time? Um, now, I don't know if it was how it was written, but I kept thinking that there was going to be like, a twist here and a twist here. So when he was talking about the guy that shot him, obviously the guy is Are you like, going to let people know what the story is about first? Why don't you tell them? Or will I spoil it? We are going to spoil it. Yeah, these are going to be ruined. So if you okay. haven't downloaded the PDF of this off of like any website in the world, um, 
these are going to get ruined. So go ahead. Well, um, I'm really bad at this, so I'll prepare you for that beforehand. But basically, it's a story told from, what's he called, Richard? Devaney. Devaney, as point of view. Um, who's dead? Who's dead, that you find out in the very first couple of sentences that he is a dead man. But um, it's based around, this whole story is based around his hatred um, an annoyance of the person who um, the other main character in the story, or one of the other main characters in the story, who is the soldier, his kind of friend. Like his, his best friend. His best friend in the world, um, who actually is in a love triangle with a girl back home, who Richard is actually married to. <laughs> The main guy was going to marry her before he went to the war, but because of her love for the other guy, I they she got couldn't... No, they were going to get married. Oh. Or did they get married? No. I don't know, because it seemed like they were never consummated. Because every time like he saw her in her boudoir, he like lost his mind. Yeah, it might be. But the, he was, he's with this girl. She chose him, the dead man. Yeah. But he has and he has this absolute jealous hatred what are you looking for? For his in quotes best friend who is the guy who found finds his body and is absolutely devastated about this wonderful companion, his best friend, who's died. And you kind of like confused like why do they hate you know, why does he hate when it obviously is this three you know, this love triangle because he just knows deep down that the, his true love who he adores is holds her true you know her heart is for the other guy which is why he's pissed off yeah and so what ends up happening is that they both get sent home well he doesn't get sent home he's dead but the buddy gets sent home from an injury in the war he gets injured at the same time that the guy gets killed yeah and is in hospital. Yeah. Um, and Richard, I've forgotten his name again. Doesn't matter. The dead man, um, the main character, discovers while he's in hospital that he can have an effect. He can kind of influence the guy who's been injured. Yeah. By only when he's very tired or he's ill or whatever, when he's weakened. Yeah. He can influence him. He could kind of like possess him and like see through. It his starts eyes. off with him just like kind of introducing he feelings yelled at him, to right? it. Yeah, and he heard him. Yeah, yeah and he I kind mean. of influences him a little bit, and it's the story builds up as his influence increases. What he can, what he learns, he can do. Yeah, and they go home, and the the villain, not villain, but like his friend, ends up marrying his girlfriend. And That's this true. pisses him off more than anything. And so, like, and again, I don't really understand how this is the best idea here. He's, okay, this is so convoluted, the way I'm even explaining it. The big thing is, is that when you die, according to him, you're supposed to go to the other side. But sometimes people get stuck for reasons unknown. And he was basically going to try to take over his friend's body so he can start sleeping with the wife and it's, hoping he could like push his soul out and that he could take over the body. So basically he can continue his, his relationship. relationship with the girl and everything will be hunky-dory. And how this got found out and started to get weird is that when he had taken over the guy's body, he called the girl a nickname that he, the dead guy, used to call the girl. So now the girl's freaking out, trying to figure out why this dude knows of her secret nickname and all this other stuff. And he realizes that, oh, this isn't going to work. So my new plan is, I'll just fucking kill her. I'll just and, kill her, and then we can share the afterlife together. Yeah, even though the big thing in the story is 
he doesn't know if like he kills her if she would actually go on and oh, he would she'll still just, be stuck. Yeah. So there the, are flaws to the plan. Yeah, flaws but to the plan. here's this is what I wanted to talk about. This is what was like glaring at me the whole time was I was under the impression that the other the German guy who killed him originally wasn't the one who killed him, and it was really his friend uh. who killed him because he was right there when it happened. He was the only other person there and wanted him to die in battle so he could go home and marry the girl mm. so in the, and that, that was just me reading into it because i sometimes make up my own plot lines when a story is boring or i didn't Not find that this it. was boring no i didn't find this boring but so the whole time i'm like going oh when's it going to come up that he was the one that killed him so you and i was waiting for, for yeah and i was waiting the whole time for this big bombshell to drop that he was the one who actually killed him and i don't think he was no, he wasn't. That wasn't the point. Okay, well, I got confused because I <laughs> added that little subplot in there. Wow. And then... So you invented a subplot that didn't happen, so you were disappointed with the whole story because it wasn't your story. No, because I was expecting that the whole time. Okay. So everything, I'm well, like, oh, just... this is going to like dig in. So here's a little story. hint, everybody. If you're going to read it just as the text is in front of you, you might actually really enjoy this, like I did. Or, if you read it and you try and figure out what's going on, and you're convinced that's what's going to happen, you might be disappointed. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. What? Go ahead. I really... I don't know what it was. Like, I can see this flaws. When you're talking about it, I can see this flaws to the plan. Flaws to the story. There's, there's like, the odd thing in there. But I don't think that takes away from it because that didn't occur to me as I was reading it. Which part about her not being able or if she if he killed her and she went over and then he was still stuck there? Yeah, because he's a flawed character to start with. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you just hadn't thought it through. He's a desperate, jealous weirdo, if you think about it, because who else would be like try to possess his best friend in quotes? So that he but could that was actually the other thing, live. because it was his best friend, but at the same time, the man he hated more than anyone. Yeah, but the other guy found him his best friend. He yeah. absolutely he thought he was the best, most wonderful person in the world. So what he was doing to try and, like, so that he didn't get any of these, like, hatred hints going on, I don't understand. Yeah, well, uh, another thing that ends up happening is... He tries to, and this is what I don't get, either. and I know he was trying to make himself look crazy, or make the guy look crazy, but whenever he went to either kill the guy or kill her, he would, like, start smiling maniacally and go, Ha ah, ha I'm gonna kill you! Ha ah, ha ha! To make the dude seem like he was insane and needed to be hospitalized. And I don't know exactly how this happened. Because everything seems very well written. Because the other thing is, this dude, um, Willard Hawkins, or whatever I said his name is, he is very articulate and could weave a tale. That's what I like the most about this. Yeah. Out of all the he stories, was just... this is the best written. Yeah. Out of the three stories of this show, um, this was definitely the best written one. Was, I will say it was, it was the best written, but it wasn't the best story. Because I don't really understand what happened at the end. I had to ask you about it, because I read it twice. And I'm like, so he was gonna kill her, but then he showed up to tell her that he wasn't gonna kill her. and He tried to kill her once. Yeah. Because the whole plan wasn't working out. So you have this really awesome scene where it's he's creeping along in the body of his friend um, and creeping into the bedroom and she sort of sits up all panicky and he kind of like snaps at, because of her screaming, the friend kind of regains his wits a little bit so the guy loses his control a little bit and there's a gunshot and you think, oh, has he killed her? But it turns out she's just in hospital. He's winger or whatever. And she's like, she's been shot. And she is it in the lung or something? There's something. Yeah, she shot her in the lung. She's really. 
But he was messed up too, right? Did he shoot himself and her? No, I think he was institutionalized because oh. he shot her. And then she did not file charges. And she didn't. She wouldn't. This file is back charges. in the day when the state didn't get involved in your shit. If you didn't want to put your husband in jail for him trying to blow a hole in you, she's you didn't very, have she's, to. <laughs> no, she's very sympathetic about it. She's worried oh, about him. Poor guy. I know because he's obviously going nuts and very upset about it. Like he knows there's something going on. He knows that he's being influenced by something, but he can't explain it to her. But she kind of knows there's something not right. And then eventually, of course, you know, she doesn't file charges. Um, so he's kind of happy because he's like, the dead man is happy because he's like, well, they may get back together, but they're never going to be happy because she's always going to have that doubt in the back of her mind that he's going to flip or he's going to do something again. Which or, she does. Which she but does. But she doesn't, it doesn't make her love him any less. No. And that's isn't. where he lost his shit. Yeah. And so at the very end, um, as he's trying again, a final attempt kind of thing, he realizes this, like, this has been going on, you know, they're back together, but there's It's been like some, years. I think. think it's years. I think it's months after the, like this after whole, her this recovery. This whole thing, stuff. how long has this whole story gone on? Yeah, possibly years. Can't remember. Okay. But anyway, she is, he, she kind of. There's a doubt, there's a weird feeling, and he kind of realises that this is never going to work out. He's never going to manage what he was going to do, and he sort of feels bad and realises the error of his ways after he's, like, like tried to shoot her. Gosh, and, yeah. This whole attempted murder spree, I'm really... Mm. I'm not feeling it anymore. Um, so he kind of decides he'll do one last sort of possession... And he does it to apologize. Right? He does it and he talks through his friend, but he calls her his Winky. Winky, which is the which is Penis. mentioned earlier. Which is mentioned <laughs> earlier, which is the nickname that only she That like, he gave her. That she knows is gonna be him. Yeah. And so he le you know, he sort of apologizes through the man and says, This won't happen anymore you know, I'm going to leave you to your peace or whatever. Um, and then it's gone. So. Which I found. Does he go to the other side? Like, I don't was think that the know piece what, he had to make? I, I think so, yeah. But okay. if he's telling the story. How did he. How did he do that? Like, he's well, always still hanging around. We have to assume that. If you're at the other side, you can still narrate a tale. Okay. I think a really interesting exercise um, and a writing prompt would be to take the same story and write it from the point of view of Winky. Of the girl. Yeah. Oh, Velma was her name. Velma, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but tell it from her point of view. Because then it's like a scary-ass ghost story. Yeah, where because you, you but just now like, I think about it, there's probably been like a ton of movies where someone's lover was possessed by someone else trying to kill them. Yeah, I'm sure there is. I think I think the thing that got me on this is the writing. I think that was the main that was the main thing I took out of it. It is really really well written. eloquently re written, isn't it? It's yeah. it's just it's beautiful, but the way and it's suspenseful. And it's really creepy. I found it creepy. Dude, that first bit, again, if we didn't already know the guy was dead, yeah, that I know, would have that been was... seriously one of the scariest things I've ever read. Yeah, it was really good. Because I really was, like, on the edge of my seat. Yeah. Yeah. It is really good. I just enjoyed this one. I, I like this one the best because I like the story. I liked how it... I, I thought the whole concept of your the person who you love like reacting after a war, which is like affected, yeah, yeah, it affected people so badly anyway. You know, you can kind of pass this off as like, you know, he's been it's PTSD. It's all this, you know, sort of post um, traumatic stress, weird things cropping back up from your memories, and all. You can push things away as as often as you can. 
but eventually it gets to the point where you're like, this is weird. And I found it really interesting. I really enjoyed it. It was a creepy concept. And I think your your partner, like, laughing maniacally, that's that's never a good thing. No, because if I were to do that... You do that in your sleep sometimes, which is (laughs) terrifying. (laughs) Um, Let's see... (laughs) I'm is, not even is it joking. Me? Is it me? I Something? hope it is. Some other person. It's it's this guy. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um. That with a return of her old confidence in him, the specter of apparition would be banished forever from their lives. Hey. I know. I just brought it down. Uh, the tone. Is that right? Do I use tone correctly? Okay. So anyway, so that was The Dead Man's Tale. And now we're going to talk about, which was my favorite story of the bunch, Ooze, a novelette of a thousand thrills. Although I didn't count, I want to say that it was very close to that. It was. It was a really good story. Maybe a couple hundred. <laughs> um. So... This story starts off, I don't want to say it starts off rough, but it starts off with a, I don't understand why this is happening kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm going to try to give you a very brief rundown. This story is actually so good, in my opinion, that I serialized it on weirdmass.com for the last, like, two weeks. Every week, or every day, another chapter was going up. Um, but basically, <clears throat> there's this guy who, I don't know why he was even involved in this. I know he was doing it for a girl. He was friends of the daughter and husband. Because he the took couple. the kid. Yeah. yeah. Because he adopted the kid. Well, he adopted their kid. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he said he would try to find out. What the heck happened to the dad who was the scientist that went crazy and disappeared? It's set. We have to explain where it's set. Yeah. It's like in the bayou kind of thing, isn't it? In a Well, that's where they end up. Yeah. Um, but like, I guess in Chicago or something, mm-hmm. like in a metropolitan area. But this like brilliant scientist goes away. And um, his son and his son's wife want to go look for him. So they go look for him and then they don't come back. Yeah. So our narrator is going down there to try to figure out. He's a journalist, isn't he? Is he? I think he is. Yeah. He's going down there to figure out what the hell happened. Okay. So he finds out that the place where he goes to, I can't remember what they call it. But there's this place that no one of the Cajuns or anybody would go to. It's like the closest thing to a haunted part of the swamp that anyone would go, right? Yeah. So this part of the story, it's not that it's boring. It's just so like, these are the facts, ma'am, you know? Like, yeah, because he's doing it from an article point of view. That's what yeah. I took from it. But I also... Go on. No. No, I'll do that after. Okay. Um, so he finds the place where this guy was staying. And there was this giant wall around the whole place. And the wall had caved in. Um, and he was trying to get people to tell him what had happened. And no one would talk to him until he found this one dude and he gave him like a bottle of shine. And um, then he got some information out of him. Mm-hmm. What are you pointing me for? To take it. Yeah? If you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, long story short. I was, oh, go ahead. Nothing. I was just going to say I found the whole writing style of this. It went from being really good. Well, it didn't. It started off, like you say, really complicated. But I, I find myself having to reread 
a lot of the passages in it, I was just like, well, it just, it was jumbled. It was kind of like, I don't know, I just found it difficult to read compared to the I felt story. like this was like reading a textbook in the beginning. Yeah, it was much more like, I don't know, it wasn't as captivating kind of thing. It wasn't it was as captivating. Not at all. But the, once this story kicks into gear... The actual subject of the story itself is awesome. Yeah. So basically what happened was this scientist was trying to create, he was working with amoebas and trying to, I don't, I don't even understand. He worked out some kind of formula which allowed whatever it was introduced to, uh -huh. whatever organism, yeah. to just grow exponentially. Yeah. Um, and it was in to try and kind of solve all the world's food problems. Like you could, you you would just get a, grow a, food, grow a giant cow or yeah. a giant, you know. So his whole research was based on this, or a giant loaf of bread. Yeah, I don't think you know. It was a living organisms. They just kept growing. Well, it was working on the cells to see that that they would just keep growing and growing. But he was obviously, through his research, he'd found that things were growing, but he had no way of knowing how big they were going to get. Yeah. And do we want to get to that bit yet? Yeah. Basically, he was doing work on amoebas, which are like a single-celled organism. Um, and he got to the point where this thing had grown. To how big did it grow to? Was it the size of like a? I don't know. It was. Uh, it, he he basically told his son to take it out back and kill it. Yeah, he got it to the size where it was maybe like a dog or something, yeah. wasn't it? Like a small animal, but it was obviously thousands of times bigger than it is in yeah. normal life. And he was like, "Well, this is obviously working, but it's getting out of control now." And his, he confided in his son about it and said, look, I want you to get rid of this. This is what's happening. This is what I've achieved. It's amazing. But I don't know what the consequences of this will be. Um, you need to get rid of it and destroy it. Why he didn't do it himself? Why he relied on his son exactly. that he just brought into it? I do exactly. not know. But the, the son's like, oh, my God. This is awesome. I'm uh, going to make some money out of this. Well, and it wasn't just that. But it he, wasn't. He wanted to, like raise it and grow it so he could prove to the world what a genius his, his father, father was. was. It was done with the best of intentions. It wasn't like a... Yeah, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That, that's true. Very true. So, he... It turns out through a long, intricate story through the his... the professor's house servant or the person who was delivering it's to delivering the house... Delivering the food. Yeah, to the yeah. house servant. Um... It turns out through him getting drunk that he told him that he had, the son had confided in him to bring food because they were going away for a couple of weeks. Yeah, and he just wanted him to hawk it over the wall. And he wanted him to just throw it over the wall and keep, you know, yeah. the thing alive. He didn't know anything about it, though, did he? He didn't know what was no, going on. He just he, knew yeah. that he had to provide food on a regular basis to this. And he... Thing saw the house servant. It wasn't over the wall at this point. He was just throwing it into this, like, mud puddle. Because was he allowed in at that point? Yeah, because it wasn't... They didn't build the wall yet. No. Okay. So, he could go in, but then he saw the, like, manservant, who... Uh, this was words I needed to look up. So, I guess the word of the day... Is an octoroon, which is one eighth African American, and we don't know if this is a scientific term that people still use. It seemed like a scientific term on Google. Yeah, it's obviously like I was saying, it's an out of date term, without a doubt. But whether it's actually still a viable term that people use, I have no idea. But I'm assuming most definitely not. But anyhow, we had to look it up. Yeah. Um, but this guy, the Cajun guy who was delivering the food by the mm. sun, he had to deliver th food into the puddle. He just had to throw whatever, like two chickens or something every day into the pond. Um, by the end of it, 
He was doing goats. He was, yeah. Things were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The, the food source was demanding more food, or the puddle was demanding more food. And when they get to the, when he got to the last couple of days, he witnessed the manservant in the middle of the pool being sucked in by a jelly-like with tentacles. With tentacles, dude. It seriously just like screamed the blob. Yeah, it's it was the blob. The like whole way I would be. Me. Like, shocked if the guy who made the blob wasn't inspired by this story. Me too. It because was completely. The description of that guy getting taken was so amazing and so brutal and so visceral. Like, it was like. Like anything you've seen in the old blob or the remake. Both blob. versions of the blob are some of my favorite, like, classic old yeah. school horror. Like that, the remake is like one of my favorite films. The remake's it's, really good. It's awesome. It's really good, and it's just like a genuine because it's a, like a huge, like seemingly mindless thing that you have no control of, and the more it eats, the bigger it gets. It's as simple as that kind of thing. I, yeah. But it can get through time and spaces, so you can't even hide in a room without but it manages to squeeze under the door. Kind this of thing. thing can't do that. No, this thing is in its contained, it's it's living in water in this puddle in the back area of the Like a little property, swampy area. A little swampy, puddly area. But obviously by the time it got bigger and bigger, um, it was kind of out growing this puddle. Yeah? This yeah. pond. Um, and obviously the more it was eating, the bigger it was getting. And I think that's why... They ended up doing the wall. Yeah, the, the professor realised what had happened. But how did he realise? Because this is awesome, too. I can't remember. He realised because he heard the wife screaming. And so he ran out there to see the amoeba killing the wife and the son. And it was like a giant-sized... Thing. Yeah, and that he's was, like, no, you're right. that the tentacles awesome. like wrapped around the leg really slow. And I think he, this was the one where they were like, he was so shocked at what was going on. He wasn't screaming. He wasn't anything. He just looked back at him with like this look of like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Like, it was just like utter horror. Yeah. Like, but shock <sighs> horror. It was awesome. It's yeah. like the visual. It, it was just like genuinely terrifying, wasn't it? Yeah. This watching your family, your your kid and the wife, just getting sucked in. And I think the wife was trying to run away. And the the I actually used the proper term for it, which I can't remember right now. Like a flagellian? No, it wasn't. It was a pro protozoan. It's basically the uh, an amoeba when it's eating when it engulfs. It actually does this. There's like bits of the body, if uh -huh. you know what I mean, kind of go round, they elongate round whatever food source it is, whether it's a cell or something that it's eating. They actually sort of extend out and engulf it back into the thing. Okay. And I can't remember the actual term that it's used, but they actually do do this. He's using the actual... Do do. <laughs> he's actually using the idea of an amoeba but on a giant scale, you know, it's not just a sort of So the scientific... science, because that was another question I had. I said, is the science accurate? Because I've seen like pictures of amoebas in school and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. but I don't remember amoebas having tentacles. And you're like, oh, well, <laughs> they don't have tentacles. And you just like they, puked out a bunch of information. They don't. They don't have tentacles. They have these processes that come out, and I can't remember what they're called. Perineums. Taint. Geesh. Chilled. What is wrong with you? <laughs> She's looking it up. Okay, so anyway, the cops ended up getting involved because they assumed that the dad murdered the son and the daughter. 
So they took him to an asylum, and he was like batshit crazy, obviously. And he's sitting here going, okay, my kids are dead, and there's a giant fucking monster in my house. Um, and if I don't get out of here to destroy that thing, um, it's going to keep getting bigger and eat the whole goddamn world. Right? Yes. Um, so, was it the Cajun or was it the actual guy who saw him on the side of the wall? I think it was the, no, I think it was the, I think it was the Cajun. Okay. So the dad basically goes up on top of this wall and he built this wall with the idea that if it didn't have a food source, it would eventually just die. Yeah. Right? So for some reason, he decided, I guess, that he would be its last meal. And he wrote this little account. Um, Which the author of the story found in a box in the Cajun's room. Yeah, and I think it's... Because what happened to him? He disappeared now, too, right? Okay. Well, we should have done this episode a long time ago because we read these stories about two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And then we were waiting. Okay. So um, he says, In my work, I have found the means of creating a monster. The unnatural thing, in turn, has destroyed my work and them whose I hold dear and those whom I hold dear. It is in vain that I. Um, something myself of innocence of spirit. Mine is the crime of presumption. Now, uh, I can't even see what those what words say. say. What, what are we reading here? It is in vain that I... I am you and myself? I don't know if that made it any better. As, as mirror Myself insane. of innocence, of spirit. Mine is the crime of presumption. Now, as expiation, worthless, though that may be, I give myself. It's better not to think of that last leap and the struggle of an insane man in the grip of a dying monster. So he writes this note and then leaves it there, I guess, and then jumps off the wall into um, sacrifices himself into the yeah into the pit and when he goes in there now he sees like the wall all broken in from the inside because the monster was trying to get out but yeah. couldn't get out um and when it did break it fell on top of it but he could he finds like little ooze bits on there's, stuff. No, there's like a thin layer because it, it spread itself out as far as it possibly could to try. So there's like a thin layer of this yeah. like dried ooze everywhere. Yeah. But it was obviously dead because he cut out the food source completely. Yeah. It was the only way he could have done it. But it, when he first went, because you actually go to the place first and he's walking around and he's like, what is this? This yeah. is weird. He can't like figure out what's going on and what what anything so is. So there is a bit of this that's kind of like a detective story because he's trying to work he's out. He's trying to piece every, all the evidence yeah, together. Yeah, and there's a lot of pieces that come up. Yeah. But I, for me, it's like not until the end when you finally have the full picture yeah. where all this stuff is like terrifying. Yeah. You know, like, because all the stuff in and of itself is such little bits uh -huh. that it's like, oh, okay, that's weird. Well, that's weird, I guess. I don't know. So I loved this, and I loved that there was a amorphous blob that was eating things. Um, it was just really cool to me. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, but, and I will say, um, in reading... H.P. Lovecraft's Supernatural Horror and Literature, the dissertation or thesis he wrote that was like 30,000 words. One of the things that he 
comes down on writers for is that there's all these writers who are creating these wonderful, like ridiculous over the top things that are extremely terrifying. Mm -hmm. But then they explain everything away to the nth degree to where it's not scary anymore. And everything has like a, so like there's a part of me that's like, I wonder what parts of this could have been taken out to not be explained and if that would make this a scarier story i don't know i think because he didn't go there wasn't like a huge lot of detail about it It, because he was finding it out through other people you just got snippets of it it's not like you were learning everything in great detail and then i think too the people he was finding stuff out from were very like unreliable sources unreliable uneducated yeah so like they're only giving him things in the way they could describe it yeah so, and then he would have to put that together. Yeah, yeah. so that works. Yeah, I felt I don't so. know. I really, really liked it. after. But see, the funny thing is, after talking about Dead Man's Tale with you, yeah, I could see that Dead Man's Tale is a much better written story. It just, it you was. Know, it's just, it's just a much. It's much smoother yeah. flowing. You know, much it's smoother like, than that sentence I just said. <laughs> yeah. It just it flowed better. It was like I don't know how to describe it. It's just more eloquently written. There was the vocabulary and everything. It was yeah. just and very like because it was somebody's feelings kind of thing. I just kind of I found it genuinely creepy sort of thing. I, this was creepy on a on a sort of B movie classic. Yeah, creepy. Well, because I really like it. I like small casts. Yeah, like like minimal locations yeah, and people going crazy. Like yeah. those are like my favorite kind of stories. So dead man's tale obviously had a lot more of that because that was the main character. Yeah. Whereas this story has that, but if this was told from the dad, I think this would have been a much better story as opposed to a guy coming to just figure out what's going on. Possibly, yeah. But you could argue the same thing that he, because he's the dad and he's a scientist and he, it, it could have been more convoluted because you were finding it out through sort of an innocent, like completely ignorant of all that was going on. Yeah. You were finding out as he was finding out, you know? I feel like this is a trope that ended up in a lot of B movies. Oh, God, yeah. It. Like where there's like this one brilliant scientist and then there's someone younger who's going to do something. And then that person doesn't do something it's like right. It's tarantula. I was just going to say tarantula. Tarantula. And then when that person doesn't do something right, guess what happens? Oh, there's a giant tarantula. Oh, and guess what happened? The scientist is now like tarantula food. Yeah. And, they and he's like a bumbling out. old fool who's yeah. like, oh, well, maybe shouldn't have done that yeah, after yeah, yeah, yeah. all. Yeah. I love um, tarantula as well. Tarantula's so good. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it's neat to see how old a lot of these cliches are, I guess. It is. And I'm sure this isn't the first time that that's happened. No, I'm not. You know? I, yeah. But like, it was still, like, such a good... The way it was written, it was... Not the way it was written, the way the story kind of unfolded. That's the wrong mm-hmm. word. Unfolded. You know, Did you say enfolded? Enfolded. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> You know what I mean, though. Like, I think it that was like, I think it was good that you found out as he found out. Yeah, it was creepy. Can I just explain to this as well? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the most important part. Like, let's just say here, um, maybe single-celled organisms that live in water, including lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, and puddles. Um, the most important part of an amoeba might be the pseudopod, which is. I think it means false like fake leg, false leg, or one foot. false limb. Uh, okay, a pseudopod. The pseudopod is used to help the amoeba move and also to eat. This part of the amoeba's body can stretch out and pull itself. With. Nice. Um, the type of movement is called cytoplasmic streaming. It sounds like Ghostbusters. Um, to eat, the amoeba stretches out the pseudopod, 
surrounds a piece of food and pulls it into the rest of the amoeba's body. I've stretched out my pseudopod before. Amoebas eat algae, bacteria, other protozoans and tiny particles of dead plant or animal matter. Look, and that's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a picture of it. Too you bad see? you can't see it. Look, it's eating that fish. Yeah. I didn't know amoebas that's not, got that big. That's not a fish. That, that looks that, like a fish. No, I think that's a bacterial cell. You're a bacterial cell. It's just a... But that's amazing. Look, it's like... Stre that's what I'm saying, where you can see that it's like tentacles. Yeah. But it's actually just the whole body extending out. Yeah. So All there right. you go. So the science does make sense. <clears throat> Good job, science. Yeah. Okay. Now you'll be thrilled and mystified by Hamilton Craigie's new novelette, The Chain. Now, I have to say that I was not expecting this kind of story. Now, I feel kind of stupid about that because um, it's on page 78. Oh, that? That? Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> this is kind of like a detective story slash pulp hero story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so this is the only story you wrote notes on? Are you joking? You know me? why? Because this is the last story that I read. And the last one is the one that I figured out that I could put highlight it. <laughs> <laughs> on iBooks. Okay. I didn't Otherwise, know. I would have been highlighted all over the shop. Okay, I'm going to be highlighting all over yeah, the shop. Yeah, we need to be highlighted. Okay. So, what I'm trying to get at with this story, yeah, there you go. Um, why don't you take it since no, I have I to walk away? I can't remember this one. Okay, it's basically a detective story. It's just story, a detective novel. But it, it's written like a, a hero pulp from the same Like period. the shadow or. Or the spider. The spider, it's that like, kind of thing. I mean, his name's ridiculous. Courier. Let or, me see, what's he what's called? What's his name? Let me see. Warrior. Warrior. And it's one of these. It makes me almost miss reading a bunch of hero pulps because it's like. I really enjoyed this for what it was. Did you enjoy how it was written? Um. Because if you did, there's like a million books you can read. I did, yeah. I enjoyed but it, but like, it was like ridiculous as well. Like, Quarrier did this thing, this and is... Quarrier's the coolest guy in the world. I'm going to read and this Quarrier... bit. Okay, read it. Quarrier was a big man and well-muscled. In his day, he'd been an amateur boxer of repute. For a big man, he was quick, well-poised, supple and controlled. A brain of ice and nerves of steel. That was Quarrier, and at that moment, he stood in need of them. Like, every single other... Said, yeah, is a description of how awesome Quarrier exactly. Is. Like the narrator's whole job, it's almost like a wrestler and a manager. the the whole The only job of the narrator is to put over how much of a badass Quarrier this guy is. is. Now, I was totally on board with this story when I was reading it because, again, this is your fault, right? Like, yeah, you but here's saying. the thing: because, like, this is weird tales. We know Weird Tales as a place of weird fiction and all this stuff. This is the first issue of Weird Tales. Weird fiction wasn't, like, solidified as to what it was, what it could be, what it should be. So when I started reading this, and I'm like, going, what the, am I reading the fucking spider here? What the hell's going on? I know, I did the same. I got I was a like... little thrown back. But I, I was kind excited. Of, but because I spoke, you told me about it, and you were like, it's kind of a detective story. So I didn't go in with that, like, what, what's this I'm reading? So I was kind of prepared for that. Yeah. But the whole way through, I'm reading going, what's weird about this? Where, where's yeah. the weirdness going to come in? Exactly. Yeah. And when I kind of gave up on this story, where um, Craigie did not do very well for me, not the Incubus, which is in next month's issue. Oh, I thought it was way closer to the beginning. I guess it's farther in. Hang out, guys. I'm trying to get to this point to show you something. The shape invisible. There you go, right there. 
basically the story. This is where I checked out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a He's diagram. Like, yeah, there's a diagram because you can't possibly imagine the layout of this room. What's a lumber room? A place where they hold lumber. But it's his office. That's why what I... Why would you, A, get an office next to a lumber room? And why would you have a door with why would a combination you have a, lock a to go into door. Exactly! And why would you have another door that's connected to just the passageway to the hall? Yeah. That anyone can just get in instead of bypassing through the entire office? Exactly! Yeah. This whole thing does not make sense. And when he's like, you know what? Perhaps it would be better if I drew a diagram. I... I I know what a fucking rectangle is. <laughs> I don't need you to draw me a fucking diagram. Like I enjoyed that. I thought that was hilarious. I thought if he didn't draw the diagram, that it would be less ridiculous. That's very true. Looking at it now, You're... it made it look like way harder. Like, why didn't the guy just go in through the... Why? It, it just, it's it screams stupidity. And it's like, hey kids, if you don't know what a fucking room looks like, they have doors and windows. windows. Basically, we haven't described the story. The whole story okay. is is that Quarrier is holding some incredibly important documents. Yeah. And the arch nemesis of the city, mm -hmm. the Joker, the Penguin, what have you, equivalent. I think his name's Bill. <laughs> like, he just has, like, a normal name. He's like Al Capone. What's his name? I don't know. Let me I'll, see. It'll pop up. I'll see it here. Yeah, basically... Oh, Marston. Marston. That's right. Yeah. The arch nemesis, Marston, is after those documents. And I would say a good third of the entire story is Quarrier describing how it's impossible for anyone to get into his lockup without him knowing about it. Yeah. Because... but. The whole point is, he has these documents, the other guy wants it. As he goes back to his office, after being beaten up and on all sorts of weird and this stuff weird, going on. long-ass taxi adventure that was kind of awesome. And then yeah, it was awesome. I'm like, oh, but I must have misplaced my gun. The gun was in your hand. How did you misplace yeah. your gun? But that was another example that I absolutely loved. <laughs> that he was actually in a room with a noose around his neck and his hands tied behind his back, okay? This is like a Bond, yeah. uh, horrendous situation that you can't possibly yeah. get out of. Unless. Unless. You have a sailor's knowledge of knots. Yep. And it, guess what? Quarrier has a sailor's knowledge. It just so <laughs> happens <laughs> to have been a you sailor. You told me about that after you read it. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> he just so happens to. So he manages to untie the knots, beat up the two snoozing thugs who yeah. were like supposed to be watching him. And get back to the thing. Now, the weirdness, in quotes, comes in when he gets back to his office and there's nobody in there, but he's sure that there is. Yeah, and that's what was... I do... See, this is why I don't like the diagram. If they would have just left that out and, like, yeah, the whole thing, like, like, he walks in and he could see there's nobody there, but he knows someone is. And he's and he looking walks everywhere, around. he looks but through he's, the window. And but he's, he's doing it really nonchalantly and like... So the, so the nothing that's in there <laughs> can't tell that he's suspicious. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it's really good in the way that it describes like it couldn't possibly be looking through the window. You know, it couldn't have got through the window because there's a 300 foot drop down yeah. to the ground. You know, it's all this kind of classic description of there's no possible way he could have got in there. Yeah. And he looks under the table. He's not even under the table, which is the only bit of like furniture in the room that he could be hiding. And if this goes on and, and on, he probably went like this. Oh, my shoes are untied. Let me bend down here. <laughs> Let me bend down. Have a, little, uh... <laughs> a little quick sneaky look under the table. <laughs> but basically, um... <sighs> keep going. You're doing good. It's, I'm liking it. I'm exhausted. I know, but you're doing a great job. Basically, he gets to the point where the only way it could possibly be that he figures out after the whole thing what's going on is that his manservant is actually in the lockup room, yeah, in the lumber room, or mm -hmm. is he in the lumber, the lumber room? room? He's in the, which I still don't know what it is, I need to look up, with Marston. So he's caught them 
in the act. And the only reason that he knew the whole time, he, he shoots Marsden, doesn't he, and kills him. That's that done. And eventually it turns round to the fact that he knew the whole time. He figured it out. Way long ago. Way long ago. Because there was a chain hanging above the entrance into the lumber room that was swinging slightly. There's no breeze, breeze in that room. There's the no only breeze way, in that room either. The only way that, it, <laughs> that anything could have touched that chain is because of his manservant's unruly hair and high-perched hat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. what it was. And so he knew, he put it two, two and two together. But it was his mad servant because nobody else has got the shock of unruly hair and, and hat. At one point in his illustrious career, he was a mathematician. <laughs> and a hat maker. And a hat maker. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> but Marsden had obviously got to his manservant and forced him to let him into the... But I, I didn't understand that because he... I felt like he was kind of in on it. Yeah. But again, that might have been me making things up. No, I think he was, but because he'd been forced into it, there was something, I can't, I must have glossed over that. There was something bad that he threatened him with to make him do it. But he, but there was reasons why that couldn't have been possible because he was like, he's only ever seen the combination when I'm with him. He doesn't yeah. know anything himself. It's uh, He's only been there when I've let him in. So it was like a bit confusing, convoluted mm -hmm. at the end, but that's why it's called the chain because that was the piece of evidence that led him to realise what had been going on. But... The weird or horrific or supernatural element to this is that there was no one in the room. That there was someone in the room. That's the whole thing. As you were reading it, the way that he got like goose, you know, his hair stood I mean, up on the I back really of his neck. I mean, I really feel like this and... is an example of this being an early magazine and the editor was not on board for the direction no, that the publisher it was a huge stretch wanted this to go yeah so um it was it was a letdown in that sense because i kept waiting for that thing to happen i know i thought something supernatural was gonna hold, like, happen the whole time. like i thought there was a ghost in the room with them yeah the whole time i'm like oh this is something's, gonna be really good yeah something really yeah. creepy is gonna happen but i think that's that's the stretch that it was like it was because he believed that obviously something supernatural must be going. He, because all his logic yeah. had let him down, like all his cleverness, you know. And I mean his art, awesomeness his in art general. skills. Yeah, I know. Look at that rectangle. But he, he kind of every all his logic, all his Sherlock Holmes putting two and two together, had failed him. He could not work out what was going on. Yeah. So he was actually starting to question the supernatural there was going to be some kind of supernatural force that had that was in the room with him and i think that's the but i mean this. his like the way the story's told like the one thing about old pulp stories like the hero pulps like everything from like putting on your socks to making a ham sandwich is the most suspenseful Bologna. thing. A bologna A bologna snanich. <laughs> it's like the most suspensefully written thing you've ever read. I really read. enjoyed it. Like, this. it's like your your heart's pounding when this guy's, like, wondering if he should put peanut butter on celery. Yeah. You know, like, that's the whole style of it. And so, when you're reading this, like, the whole time you're like... <gasps> and I mean, I know that the... I guess age range for this style of story um, was like working class males, but like I could totally see some like twelve year old kid with a flashlight under his under a sheet reading this, yeah, like they would completely love losing it. his mind, like oh my oh god, what are you gonna do? <laughs> oh my god, your room's a rectangle, like just completely. <laughs> Completely losing their mind. Um, it's it's such a like classic time for literature. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like these pulp stories are the 
they're always entertaining. As far as I, I can tell. I mean, tell, especially, you know I mean? like, just... you would love Doc Savage. Because, like, yeah. Doc Savage is basically who Indiana Jones was kind of based on. Yeah. Like, you would, like, you would die. You would die reading Doc Savage stuff. You really, really? I really think that would be, like, your, like, your main... I find, I find myself overwhelmed. The bronze g- god, or whatever his nickname is. Really? Yeah. Oh, God, I'm totally lured. But I think my, my problem is I get overwhelmed because there's so many books that I have to read mm-hmm. and so many books that keep cropping up that I think, oh, my God, I totally love that. And I'm actually scared of getting into something ridiculously because I know I'm under pressure. And it shouldn't ever be like that, but it's pressure pressure in the best possible way because I want to fill my mind up with all yeah. sorts of awesome stories and you just don't have the time to be I, able to do I it. I really, you know? I, I don't. And when I look at like the spider, if you've never read the spider, I would love not, the spider. not the newer incarnations, no, but the all of stuff. the, um, yeah, the classic stuff, all the stuff that is written um, by Grant Stockbridge, who that was a house thing. It was mainly Norvell Page that wrote the majority of the spider stories. There are a couple by RTM Scott, who has a story in here that we will get to eventually. But those stories are so flipping good and action packed and just ridiculous. And Norvell Page was kind of batshit crazy. I mean, he was turning in, like, a novel or two novels length worth of stuff every month. Like, oh, but he would random. he would show up dressed up like the spider to deliver the stories to the, the publisher's secretary and talk like the spider. Like, he was nuts. He sounds awesome. Yeah. But, like, it's just so much fun. And, like, the spider, to me... Like, I know Stan Lee said, like, that's where he wanted to take Spider-Man from, to have, like, the Spider-Man. But to me, the Spider is basically Batman. Like, beyond a shadow of a doubt. The dude's, like, filthy fucking rich, has everything he could possibly ever want, but he just likes to fight crime. For no other reason other than he just thinks crime's bad. And I ain't got nothing better to do. So I'm going to beat the shit out of all these people, (laughs) murder them, and then, like, burn them with my insignia so the cops know it was me. Like, oh my god, this guy is batshit crazy. I love it. Yeah, I know. That sounds amazing. It's just so much fun. Um, But, so next time, um, we're going to crack into these 22 remarkable short stories. Um, I've already read um, the first two here. But... um, should we just do this page? How and many pages are each? Like, they're anywhere from, like, five to six pages to, like, two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, we could burn through a ton of these. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Do you want to do all of them, or just this no, page? No, I think we'll just do one page, because okay. we'll end up talking for ages on each one. and that one. Yeah. So there's some really good stuff in here. So next time we're going to be talking about the mystery of Black Jean, which is actually really fun. Um, is it? That but sounds awesome. the surprise at the end, I don't think is a surprise at all. It's the thing you expect at the very beginning of the story to happen. Well, let's see if I do, because okay. I'm the worst person for guessing the ending of anything. All right. Then we have The Grave by Orville R. Emerson. Park, The Rattle by Joel Townsend mm. Rogers. The Ghost Guard by Brian Irvine. The Ghoul and the Corpse by G.A. Wells. Fear by David R. Solomon. Uh, the Place of Madness, Madness by Marilyn Moore Taylor. Merlin. The, Merlin. He's a wizard. The Closing Hand by Farnsworth Wright. A Brief Story. Powerfully written. That's the classic. Right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and again, it's funny because Farnsworth Wright is the person who becomes the editor of Weird Tales. Really? Very soon after this and actually makes Weird Tales into the mega pulp that it became. Um, the Unknown Beast, Howard Ellis Davis, The Basket by Herbert W. Mangham. 
That's a I, I, the accusing yeah. voice by Meredith Davis, and then the sequel to Edgar Allan Poe's *The Cask of Amontillado*, which is not the way to say that. The way you said it was also not the way no, to say it. No, I know. It. I listened to this podcast, and they were talking about it, and they said it a completely different way. But I remember that that's the way Vincent Price says it. So it must be so right. it must be correct because yeah. Vincent Price would not get bogged down with faulty pronunciation. Bullshit. Exactly. So anyway, so I hope you enjoyed this. Let us know down below what you think of these. If you read the stories and what you thought about them, um, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.